Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Nick. Nick Bukar. I work for Cities, a non-profit organization, and this is basically a bit my my focus. I work a lot with startups. I work a lot with scale-ups, um, and I have my technical background. I've developed software for uh, a commercial software for like ten years or so, always in product companies, and I try to transfer that to 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 many of my clients. As a non-profit organization, we can work uh, with small startups as well. We work. I, and, and most of the things I'm going to talk today are observations I, I, I made during my work with a lot of clients. Um, I'm a big believer in Agile. I've, I've been in an XP team. I know, I know Docker sounds familiar for me. I've written an Ansible script or two, so I, I know a bit about DevOps. Uh, I follow the DevOps movement already a long time in the background. I'm not, such, I'm not, deep, into, uh, in, I'm not deep into it. Um, actually, what I am deep into is product management. When I work with a lot of startups and even scale-ups, I see that product management for, for is, is, is often a role that is not even clearly defined in the companies I work with. So they bring a software product to the market, a SaaS product in most cases, which is all about basically building a super stellar product. And yet that role of, of product management management is, is never really made, is often not made explicit. It's a super tough role to be in, right? You, you, you have to think about your customer a lot, and actually not, in, not your individual customers, but customers that I, you, you, the segment you're dealing with. You have to convince all the techies and the developers to, 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 to make a, a nice product, uh, to make a nice, super nice user experience. And at the same time, you, you worry about business things, business KPIs that you, that you want to, to achieve with your software, with your, with your product, right? And that's a very, very hard role to, be, to, 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 be, to do. Now, you can wonder why am I talking here on a DevOps conference about, about product management? Well, I think that a modern software product management and DevOps is a match made in heaven, or could be a match made in heaven. A lot of the stuff that happens in the DevOps community, things like measuring continuous deployment, blah, 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 all that stuff, could actually be very, very, very helpful for modern software product managers. In the rest of the talk, I'll try to explain that, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you insight on why that matters so much in today's software business, software industry. Point is, the last four or five years, making a living with software and making a living with software products became, it had changed completely. That changed an awful lot. We have now cloud and mobile and all that stuff. All that, all that, all these APIs, all that infrastructure, it is there. It's for granted. You can just tap into it and, and build stuff. Um, we have new distribution channels. We have learned that the internet, app stores, are, and, and app stores and that kind of stuff are channels that are very viable channels to bring software to the market. You don't need a sales force anymore. To, to, you don't need that uh, FUD thing anymore. You can just bring your, bring your software to the market via the internet. This is, this is completely different than five years ago. Today, enterprise, soft enterprise software is being sold via landing pages. Well, not all of it, but still. And from a user's perspective, many users don't necessarily um, want to own the software anymore. They are very fine with just renting it. So that is, this completely changed. On the other hand, on the technical level, yeah, we are in a perfect storm. There's never been that, that many open source projects. I mean, look at GitHub, as I mentioned. There's so much open source. There, is, there are so much cloud APIs out there that actually building something is not so challenging anymore. It is relatively easy to build nice products these days. This, this, is, this is different than five years ago. This is definitely different than 10 years ago. And you see that also in, in, in the whole world. This, these are numbers from Belgium. You see, since 2010, we see a tremendous increase in startups. We see a tremendous amount of entrepreneurs who, who, who see this, um, this evolution and who say, OK, we, we're going to build a product and we're going to bring a new product to the market. 2010 in Belgium was, was a big peak. This is what I would call the Amazon effect. By then, Amazon Web Services is, let's say, mature enough to build, to build nice products on top of it. And you see, uh, many people are building uh, stuff on it. 2014 was a was a big other peak here in Belgium. By that time, our ecosystem became a bit self-aware in Belgium. We uh, there, there became more and more support for startups. 
things like incubators, accelerators, blah, blah, blah. And virtually everybody who wants to start a software company today is starting a software company today. This is different than, than it used to be. On the other hand, <laughs> we as users, we are super spoiled by everything. Prices are going down a lot. Stuff that costed a lot of money in the past is now virtually for free. I look in the App Store, a lot of these games and, and that software that you, that you have in, in your app stores is virtually free. It doesn't, mean it's super easy, it, it's, it's, it doesn't mean it's free to build these things, but people are not used to pay a lot anymore. If you look at the, the typical uh, price tables of SaaS companies, we're not talking about thousands and thousands of dollars anymore. You start with 25 or $10 a month. This is, uh, this is a price table from Buffer, for example. You can start using it for free. That's a tremendous amount of value that is created without actually being paid for it. Which brings, us to, uh, which, which brings me to something that my colleagues and I call the software paradox. Software in itself, so the stuff we're all dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, is creating more value than ever before. I mean, everything is software. It is. Software is eating the world, uh, like Andreessen said. And at the same time, it becomes harder and harder to make a living with software. Like 10, 15 years ago, even five years ago, if you could, if you could build it, well, I wouldn't say you, you got immediately paid, but I mean, building something was almost good enough to get paid for it. Today, this is not the case anymore. You can perfectly build something that is actually used by a lot of people and, and, and have zero income from it. So this is, this is what I would call, a, this is a real paradox. Now. Can you ask, yeah, how do you survive that paradox? Yeah, uh, I see two strategies. Strategy number one is, well, actually, you, you try to do something else next to the software. I'm going to do a little quiz. Eh? Hardware is one of, these, one of these things that you can add to your software to make it more valuable. Uh, any idea of, uh, you know, iPad apps are virtually free. You know, Game of, game of Goose, the cancel board. Any idea on how you can charge Customers like 20 euros for an iPad game of Goose? Any idea? Well, you just sell a bit of plastic with it. That's what, MB, uh, that's what Jumbo does. They sell you these little thingies, thingies plastic, plastic things, specially designed for the iPad, which is basic bollocks, it's just plastic. The game itself is, of course, free in the App Store, but this cost, uh, uh, when, they, when they launched it, it was 20 euros or so. They had it for Game of Goose, they had a little fishing game, and actually these games are very lousy, but people buy this. You can, I think on Ball.com you can still buy them, they're, they're 13 euros now. That's how you can charge 13, or in the, at the time, 20 euros for a, for a Game of Goose on the iPad. If they would just have released this, yeah, then zero is the price. Eh? Uh, on the high end, Barco is doing something similar. Who knows these clickies? Have seen these clickies? This is like now, they, 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 it's, it's almost 100 million that they make a year with these little clickies. So you, you, you just put it there, clicks, and, and you, you beam it on your screen. No more cables, no more, no more things. They could very well make an app for that. And they are very aware that they could make an app for that. But they won't. Because if they package it like this, they can charge a ginormous amount of money for it compared to if they would make an app for it. A second strategy is you could add, you could, and that's what you see more and more, you, maybe within your software you have data. Data that you can sell or can, can refurbish or repurpose for something else. Eh? LinkedIn, for example. If they would not have that social network, they'd be just a SaaS player that offers solutions for hiring people. But the fact is they have that network, they have your and my CV and our connections and blah, blah, blah. And that makes their, their SaaS offering, which is in the end where they make the, the, the real money is made, makes their SaaS offering a lot more uh, interesting. Uh, who, who, has, who wears a Fitbit? Who has a Fitbit thing? Uh, at least one healthy person in the room. Uh, or at least want to be a healthy person. Fitbit, is this, these are these guys that make these, uh, these fitness trackers. They have a deal in the US with uh, insurance companies, with some insurance companies. If you, as a customer, allow the insurance company to see your Fitbit data, you get discounts on your life insurance. Because then they can make a better assessment whether you are actually a healthy person or not. I believe that, I, I mean, this hardware of Fitbit, this Fitbit hardware, this is becoming commodity at a, at, a, at a super fast pace. But the fact that they have all that data, that very personal data, and that they, that they make deals to sell that, makes actually Fitbit, I think, 
stronger as a, as a, 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 a so it's a good way to monetize things. So either that's either you add to tackle to to fight that uh, software paradox. Either you get a bit out of the software itself and you try to add some to complement your software with either hardware or data. Or second strategy, you accept that software is becoming a commodity. No matter how complex your software is, no matter how it thing, it becomes a commodity. And you, you really exploit that to the max. This, is, this will be the remainder of, my, of the presentation because that's what I know best and that's where the DevOps story comes in. If you want to, if you, if you, if you treat software really as a commodity, as something that 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 is, yeah, almost like like water. And I'm not speaking about servers and and, and networking anymore. I speak about really also users and end user software. Well, there's there's three, three things or four things you need to uh, three things you need really to think about. First of all, modern software you 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 think about a cloud-based delivery model, something I uh, you, you 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 use the cloud. It's Super simple, it's cheap distribution. Uh, you try to, to 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 have a whole your whole sales cycle as online as possible. Super easy. Second thing, you aim for hyperscale, meaning you will have to work with a small team, and that small team has to uh, cater to a lot of customers. Yeah, the companies like like take Skype for example. They are the biggest telco in the world. At, if you look at almost forty percent of the international phone calls go over Skype, 40%, they are 1,500 people. I mean, our national pride, Proximus, they are like 15,000 people. That's what I call a difference in scale. So you will, you'll have to, you have to operate at hyperscale. So you, your team has, will be small, will have to be super clever, automate a lot of stuff, all that, all that stuff, in order to, to, to attend to a lot of customers. Second thing, hypercare. Despite the fact that you are operating on a large scale, you will have to, um, in, this, in, this, in, in such a model, you will, you will have to optimize the value you extract from customers across their whole lifetime. Which means that in, in the early days, you just sold a license of your software and the deal was done. I mean, money on your bank, maybe a maybe support contract. But actually, in these days, the ideal customer, and I, this is, was a customer who bought your software and never used it. I mean, the money was on your bank account anyway. They were not complaining about it. They were maybe thinking internally, and damn, we should have, shouldn't have bought it, or that software didn't bring this, this thing we had hoped for. But in the end, for you as a, as, as a vendor, the deal was done. This is not the case anymore, in a, in a, in a, in a, for example, in a SaaS model. There you, you have to continuously keep delivering uh, up until your promise, or they just cancelled your the, the account. So it means that despite the fact you're operating with very few people on a very large scale, you still have to know your customers very, very well, almost on the individual level. I'll give a couple of examples later on. And these two, hyperscale plus hypercare, that's what we internally at Sirius call design for valorization. It means like you design your software not just to create value, because that's what we are used to think about. We design your, we design, we need to design modern software with the aim of how can I valorize, how can I get or monetize it. Yeah. A couple of, 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 of champions there who, who has who has kids and knows Clash of Clans. They make at, at one point I, 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 have, I don't have the numbers of the day, but like a couple of months ago, they were making five million a day, five million dollars a day with a free game. How did they do that with in-app purchases, blah, blah, blah. Point is, they added a lot of barriers in that game. I mean, either you just have a lot of patience and you keep on repeating the same lame movements and same lame things all over again, or you just buy virtual credit, okay? Thing is, the monetization, monetization strategy for that game is actually completely engineered. Monet making money with this thing is an engineering problem. It is not a sales problem, this is not a support problem, this is an engineering problem, right? Slack, they're growing ginormously. Uh, I mean, who, has, who is on Slack? Who is not on Slack? It's probably easier to count. A couple of people, actually. Uh, they're growing super fast. The point is, this growth does not happen just like that. 
That's because they, uh, first of all, Slack has a network effect inherently. I mean, chatting with your own is pretty silly. Although even for that, chat, chat has this chat, uh, Slack has this chatbot and this integration. So even on your own, Slack is, is a bit useful. Um, but thing is, uh, if they w if they hadn't engineered that that uh, that, that whole exp onboarding experience, all these all these these apps and everything on it, this is this is clearly engineered. This is not because Slack has a has a ginormous sales team. I mean, I think there are only 430 people for the moment, which is okay. This is a nice nice sized company, especially for Euro for Euro for Europe. A software company of 500 people would be co would be considered a ginormous company, but I mean. In the light of things, to serve five mil four million daily active users with 400 people, such growth, it's not bad. Eh? Um, thing is, we see we see with these kind of type of companies, we see the birth of what I would call full stack companies. These are companies that control a, a large part of the user experience, from sales to, of course, offering the service to after sales to upselling. They 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 own that whole. Um, that whole experience. They take take Netflix. They 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 know what you're doing. They 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 shape that. They engineer that experience from the moment you sign up to them, to everything you watch, to even when you leave, and they exploit that for their own benefit to the max. Um, companies like Uber do the same. I mean, Google probably does the same as well. That's a new. That's a new kind of. That's a new breed of companies that will probably survive in this. In this. Uh, this, this. This software paradox. Now I work most with SaaS companies, software as a service companies, or companies that want to be want to go to software as a service companies. Let me quickly go over how they would tackle that, that paradox. Okay, and where where some of them fail. Of course, as a, as SaaS itself uses the cloud as a delivery method it's super interesting that is that is they are they are really on par with this this new um, cloud based paradigm but what i see a lot is that um, saas companies still build a lot of the software underneath it themselves they okay they use amazon they use uh, they use they use s3 they or the google alternative or the azure alternative but for a lot of other functionalities in, in their software they're still engineering a lot themselves while they, in my opinion, they could be leveraging hundreds or tens of other APIs, which makes it easier for them to, with a small team, create a lot of impact. Okay, that comes with a lot of <laughs> a lot of issues themselves, but in the end, they should also think about think about that. Um, there is, for most of the of the stuff under the hood of a, of a modern SaaS product, there's an open source alternative. Uh, there's open source for that. There's an API for that. Which means you shouldn't be building it. I see today still teams that build their own logging infrastructure. And then I'm wondering, yeah, unless you are a company like Logly, for whom logging is core business, I wonder why a company in eHealth is building their own logging infrastructure. So lever I if if you if you even SaaS companies um, and I know, of course, you are deep into DevOps. You are deep technical people. For you, you understand that there's a lot of APIs, but still, a lot. I still like to have to explain to a lot of people, also people who are deep into into SaaS, who have successful SaaS companies today, that the the the, the idea of, of building something your own, yeah, you should resist that. Uh, this is a story from uh, a customer of mine, Pro Soccer Data. They uh, they do an ERP system for football clubs, for professional football teams. At a certain point in time, the Belgium Soccer Federation um, asked them, like, look, guys, we have uh, five to ten terabytes of, uh, of video material that we want to distribute via your platform to, uh, to, our, to, to all the football clubs in Belgium. Now, if you are, into, if you are uh, a SaaS in soccer, and you want to reach your, 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 the, 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 the football clubs in Belgium, and the F soccer federation themselves offer you a, a way to get in into all these, these clubs, yeah, you have to do that, right? That is a golden opportunity. In 2007, that would have been a completely no-go. At the time they got that question, they were, they, were, they, were, they were not outgrown their basement yet. Eh? They had a couple of customers, including Anderlicht. Um, but there were still two people, one, one more sales guy, one, uh, one sales guy, one more the technical guy. In 2007, you, you simply, that would be a very hard, very tough 
question to CS2. You had to invest in infrastructure to host all this, all this video. Uh, you had to be very good in video encoding and make sure it's for the net, blah, blah, blah. 2010, you have Amazon. Bas the basic building blocks of Amazon were there. You could build such a video conversion pipeline yourself by the time, by the time but you still have to be very good at FFmpeg and all that kind of stuff, which is, I, I guess, it's a month's work at least. And you have to operate it, everything, so it's not easy. Today, yeah, it is just five lines of code. I mean, Amazon has a, a elastic uh, transcoder. There's, com uh, there's the services like Zencoder. They just I, so they went when they came to me with this question. And Nick, we got this golden opportunity, but we, we are doomed. I told them about this. I said, okay, look, we, we looked at a couple of these APIs. Five days later, they had it up and running. They had it working, and I said to the to the football bond, to the soccer federation, bring it on. Super easy. This is the reality of today. This is the cloud. This is much more than just server. Uh, if, you're, if, if you think you have to build all that stuff yourself, competitors of yours somewhere else in the world are just leveraging the others. That, that's, that's for me the best illustration of what the cloud today is. So I give as advice of SaaS companies, uh, leverage the cloud, but leverage not only for your sales and for your delivery, but lever leverage for your entire stack. Hypercare, uh, sorry, hyperscale. If you, if you are into SaaS, or if you are a modern software company, you really have to think about how can I leverage my team to the max? How can I serve an, an a, a, a ideally a ginormous audience with very, very little people? Of course, that means automation, that means, that means clever people who, who build clever stuff, clever product management, clever sales, clever growth, all, all of them need to be clever, and they should lever technology a lot. I would, I, I'm not saying it's possible for every single business, but I would aim at 100% uh, self-service. At least that should be the aim. Try to, try to engineer your whole, your whole setup from, from your sales and marketing all the way to, to when, when a customer is about to churn. Automate as much as possible and make it so that that, that, that customer can, can self-service. Because in the end, you should do the math. Eh? 20, how, how, how many customers do you need to serve for 25 euros a month, so to speak, to, to pay your team? If you, if you need five people, let's say on, uh, five people, that's uh, 5,000 a month you need to pay for, uh, for each of them, bruto, in, to in total. That's 25,000 a month. That's at least 1,000 customers that you have to serve each and every month to be, to be just break even on the, on the personnel level, right? And in order to, to, to have a bit of leeway to, to, to accommodate growth and everything, you, you, you need a bit more than that. I mean, these 1,000 people, if, if you need to serve them with five people, you have to be clever. Hypercare. When you look at, so let's, let's, how can you serve? What, what do you need to think about when, when serving a lot of customers? Well, actually, for a SaaS, there's only two metrics that really count. That's cost of acquisition. How much does it cost me to bring in one user? And customer lifetime value. I want to, and especially that last one, that is when, when the users are, are, are with you, you want to, to, make that, to, to, to make that as high as possible. You want to ensure that you give them a super good product and a super good experience. Stellar support, I mean, the last S in SaaS is for service, and you have to service them the whole time, and you have to fight churn actively. Take a company like Netflix, you probably heard that story before, but this is this guy who's watching Star Trek for a while, and he's watching Star Trek, season five, episode four, and he gets into this endless loop of three seconds, somewhere halfway the episode. Who knows that story? Okay, one, so that, that's very good that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm not boring you with that story. Um, so this guy, um, he was just strange. He swipe, uh, swipes the, 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 the player a bit to the left. Again, same three seconds. Stuck in the same three seconds. Start to get a bit pissed off. He takes his, I his iPhone, opens the Netflix app there. Of course, Netflix is clever enough to remember where he was. Jumps to the episode, boom, three seconds loop again. By now, this guy is pissed off. So he angrily takes his, takes his, uh, goes to the chat. Uh, support chat that uh, Netflix has, and there he's welcomed by, this is the good ship, Netflix, this is private, Brian speaking, how can I help you? This is StarTech speak. So in the next 15 minutes, a whole chat discussion, 
starts in Star Trek speak because, yeah, and in the end, after, after 15 minutes, that guy is helped and he had a customer support experience that he will never ever forget. He will brag about this. You can find the transcripts of, of this chat session online. Um, but this is, not, this is not a coincidence. Netflix operates in a super competitive market. They have to do very clever things. I mean, they're, they're, they're an example in the DevOps world as well. They do super clever things for 7.99 a month per user. And HBO and Telenet and all the others are there to just try to get you away from Netflix. So competition is very hard. So they have to fight for every customer at scale. So that customer was about to be super pissed off on, on, on Netflix. They turn that around through stellar support, which is engineered, by the way. By the time that guy took that chat window, they know everything about him. They knew he was binge watching Star Trek. They, they knew that. They have, they have that in their, in their metrics, right? They knew he had, when, they, when they looked at it, they knew he had a problem because they saw that he was, he was, he was stuck there. They routed that call to one of their service engineers, who, because they all have a Netflix account as well, of course, who is profiled to be a Trekkie. So he, I mean, but this is engineered, this is not coincidence, right? So that's what, that's what you need to do. Today, for SaaS companies and for the sales and marketing and support are engineering problems. These are not sales anymore. This is not, these are, these are engineering problems. Where the scope of product management used to be here, we, knew, we used to think about your yeah, value creation, which means coming up with features and coming up with, with new ways to uh, new new stuff that would be helpful helpful for our, uh, our our customers. It moved a bit to value delivery as well. I mean, now we are also responsible to keep the lights on and to keep the service running. But in the end, today, it's full stack. We are also we have to, we have to think about value capture as well. I have to optimize it as well. For me, I mean, I, I told you I'm, 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 I'm doing Agile since Agile existed and probably per, per accident a bit earlier, as, uh, earlier than that as well. The real the Agile adagio, adagio of apply, inspect, adapt for a modern SaaS company, for modern full stack companies, this can be done in real time, end to end. And you should exploit that to the max which gives rise to what I would call data-driven product management. You can measure everything, potentially. You can measure the whole, the whole, the whole user experience. Well, you should do it and, 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 and use that to optimize the, the, the whole cycle, not only the product features, but also the delivery and also the value capture. Which brings me to DevOps, because in the DevOps community, you are used to measure everything. I, okay, there is still, I know that monitoring sucks, sucks, but still, at least it's done, it's being done. It is, there is, there's a lot of support for that. And I'm just taking here, a, I took a random snapshot of, of Kibana and, 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 and Logstash and the whole shebang. I mean, there's, 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 a, there's, there's a lot of solutions out there. On the product management level, there's a lot of tools. There's tools galore, most of them have analytics in it. But if I ask to, to, to many product managers or people in the role of, or that should be in the role of product management, yeah, what's the overall status? Where are you? Uh, what, what, can you show me your funnels? Can you show me? Most of the people just go blank. Yeah, 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 we have a bit of intercom, we have a bit there, we have a bit there, but there, 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 product, I've seen very little product managers and it's probably also might be my bias because by the, with the companies I work with. But who, who, who have this, who, 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 who would, they dream from dashboards like this, but then on, on their level, not on CPUs, and, but on the level of, of really on, on, on the level of the business KPIs. You know, as DevOps, that speed matters. You, you, you are, you know that you want to go from, from it works on my machine to production as fast as possible without jeopardizing quality and blah, blah, blah. You, you, that, is, that is a continuous delivery, continu a continuous value creation. You know about that and you optimize for that. Well, product managers actually love that because that gives, you, that gives them tools, that gives them stuff in their hand that makes it possible to experiment and to try to, try to go fast and to experiment not so much on the level of the technical things, 
because that's mostly of the time under control, but really on the level of product, on the level of the kind of how they, they do their service. So I think as product managers, we can, we can I, there is really a lot that we can benefit and lever leverage from the DevOps community, uh, you, and vice versa, probably. I mean, I will be, I, I will be building, or I build pro, uh, product management dashboards based upon a lot of the tools that are actually used more for server monitoring and everything, but I use those for product management stuff. I love the idea of, um, of lean startup and agile and fast feedback. I try to put that also on, on the level of really the product itself, on the messaging in the product, on, on how, you do your, how, do you, how you do your support and measure the impact of what I'm doing. Um, I also think that a good sales company or a good online company, full stack company, sees its product and its user base and all that stuff more as one giant living lab, something that is a playground where you can, you can try things out. And you should do that to optimize things, to, to figure out what is really the, 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 the thing that, that, that makes users stay with me, stick with me, and, and become almost advocates for my, for my software. Because that's what it takes to become a full stack company. And I think in this, in this, in this world, of, of, of abundance and software as a commodity, you have to become a full stack company or die. Now, just a couple of, <laughs> yeah, it is like that. I mean, if you don't do it, there's probably a couple of people in a garage and on laptops somewhere else in the world doing it for you. And they treat it, they treat it as they treat themselves as a full stack company and they'll iterate faster and they'll learn much more, much faster uh, where, where growth is, where, where, where the, the sweet spot is for your product, and they'll outcompete you, and you'll die. That's the word. Now, where do I, if, if I go in in a, in a, in a startup, and I, like, I, I work mostly with, with smaller companies who are not really, they're, they're, not, they're not scaling up to hundreds of thousands, they're, they're, they're getting from zero to, to their first couple of hundreds, if not thousands. Where do I really start? I typically start with the onboarding process. I mean, onboarding means the, that whole experience from, okay, I stumbled, I don't know exactly how, but I stumbled upon your landing page. Um, I think you have well, something that I might need. Let's make an account. That's the first. And then the whole process to say, okay, actually, I, I like this tool. This, 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 this solves the problem for me. That's the whole onboarding process. So onboarding is a lot, lot more than just to sign up. I mean, if that's your if that's your KPI, that yeah, we, they made an account, we onboarded them. Yeah, I mean, forget about it. That is not that is yeah. Then you haven't you haven't somebody made an account yeah. Um, so that's where I typically start, and then it starts. And then the pro the product manager in me jumps up and says, okay, what is this? What do you think should be a wow moment that that a, a new customer? What is a wow moment for him? A moment that he realizes, whoa. This new piece of software, this Mailchimp or whatever, or this buffer or this this whatever this showpad, is actually going to go. It it can have a place in my life. It can solve. It can make my life easier or better. So you have to think about that. And this is even an assumption because your customers might or your users might even think about something else that that is wow for them. The second thing I talk that we typically look at is, okay, how much steps, or what are the steps a user need to take to get to that wow moment? And how did you implement it today? I mean, most, at least that's my observation with my customers, most of us are engineers, and they, they, we, have, we built complex products, and the onboarding, for example, yeah, that's typically, yeah, Best case scenario, uh, so, so an overlay that points, yeah, now I should fill in there and should fill in there. That's often, that's as far as it goes. While I think you should, you should really take onboarding as something, as a first class citizen, even, even I, maybe even impo more important than the rest of your product. And then you start into more analytic stuff. Uh, what do you want to measure? 
how how do how can you measure that experience? Because if you want to change something, you want you want to at least have a baseline. Where are we today? If I change small or bigger things, does it improve or not? So then the whole monitoring comes in, and that's 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 interesting. Some of the tools I use for that, especially in the early phase, things like Hotjar and Inspectlet. I don't know anybody familiar with those. These are things that. These are tools that are simple Java, JavaScript snippets you put in your front end, and they record how people use your software. So you get actually movies of people scrolling to your, using your software. Um, when I, I, I built a little SaaS tool myself last year, when I saw some of these movies, so I, was, I felt so big. You see people hesitate. You see people, you, you have spent a lot of time thinking about how would somebody use my thing here. And you, you thought about your copy, you thought about the feature you would expose them first. You actually did all your homework, and then you see it in reality, and people hesitate. People spend 10 minutes over, over filling in a wizard that you think is, should be like a two-minute thingy. You see them go back and forth. That's the kind of stuff you want to learn from your users. And tools like this uh, make, that, make that just as easy as using, uh, as using Google Analytics. I'm a big fan of intercom.io. Which is a, a modern CRM tool, if you like, for for SaaS companies, where you can model all sorts of flows. In the free in the free um, in the free version, um, what I do is I just create a co I, I just make that my onboarding flow gives a, sends a couple of events to to Intercom, a couple of steps, and then I make a segment in in Intercom, which is basically a, uh, an Elasticsearch query. And I call those troubled on borders. These are the ones that, let's say in two or three days, don't go through all these steps. These are the troubled on borders. These are people who act, they came in, but somewhere along the way I lost them. And these I contact and I start talking about, start talking with them to understand why, why, why are you leaving me? What's wrong? Well, did, was, was, it, was it not clear? Maybe the tool wasn't for you. Maybe, maybe what I built was not for you. But that's the kind of stuff you need to do to make your product better. These are just a couple of conclusions. Right, one, one last slide. I think the whole idea of, of DevOps and measuring everything and automating and, and, and that kind of stuff. And product management, modern product, product management for full stack software companies, it should be a match made in heaven. It isn't for the moment, at least not for the companies I work with. And it will be my focus for the next three years or so. I have got a... Um, the fact is that you as as DevOps, you know how to how to how to monitor, how to deal with, how to, how to visualize that data, how to communicate with, communicate that data, how to act upon that data, alerting, monitoring. You know all that. I mean, we, I think we should bring that to the level of really the product and a bit higher than just I just than the under than the, than the underlying infrastructure. And yeah, we have a lot of lot, lot of lot to learn from each other, and that's basically why I'm here. Okay. That was that was it. Um, I hope you find it useful. <laughs> Maybe question, time for questions or not? We have time for questions. Thank you. Yeah. Two questions and then time for the break. I see a hand going up here. Um, <clears throat> about the concept of uh, hyperscale. Um, the reality is probably that the market is already taken by a few big players that satisfy most of the, the functionality. So if you come in that market, it probably uh, makes more sense to target uh, a niche mm -hmm. with a specific need that's not covered by the big players. So I'm not sure about the concept of, of hyperscale. This is, uh, do you have alternative strategies for a situation like that? Where you're entering the market as a niche player, you can always. I mean, that I'm talking now mostly about companies who do really who bring software products to the market. Of course, you can do. For example, you, you can you can decide to be a, more a project business, where you say, look, uh, in in this market, there's already products enough, but there is uh, we feel a need for uh, servicing. And, and bringing these products and, and customizing these products and bringing them into the that's of course a viable model. But also in the service, in the in the product software product uh, project business, the margins are getting slow, lower and lower. The time that you could charge, like what is it, fifteen hundred euros a day, 
uh, as an Oracle consultant, I think for most of the, for, for, for most things, th these days are gone as well. So either you, you just, in, in, you stay in more, more you, you take a more project-based approach, you optimize there, you also go for more niches. Eh? We, do, we do Java, we don't do .NET, for example. We, set, we, we, we standardize on certain technologies so that we can optimize our delivery there. Uh, that's an option. But if you go for the product route, I think there is there's there's very few other alternatives today than to go for for, for what I what I put forward here. Um, I don't necessarily agree with the fact that there is already a solution for everything. Um, of course, there are an awful lot of software out there, and there's an awful lot of solutions of there. But these things have their problems too, and you find businesses being built, yeah, where 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 some of the big players leave leave a hole, and you start small. Of course, you start small, and you work, you work your way around, uh, you, you, you work your way up like that. But in the end, I, if if you are only charging 25 or 100 a month, you have to have a lot of customers, or otherwise, it's financially just not viable. All right, thank you, Nick. Um, we have a break for about half an hour.